G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Matt Cunliffe from Mortgage Choice in Brisbane. Uh, he's obviously based in Brisbane, so thanks for your time today, Matt. No worries, all Troy. Thanks for having me. Let's start with how we know each other. I think was it New Year's Day this year down at Hobart Brewing Company. Um, I was grossly hungover, and I was down there with my chocolate Labrador Carlton supporter. And I think your wife and daughter came up to have a chat with Douglas. That's correct. That's that's how a lot of my business is done. My my beautiful daughter, and my wife, speaking to randoms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Douglas is very friendly, staring at me right now. I actually, can hear his name. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. All right. So I own uh, Mortgage Choice in Brisbane. Uh, Mortgage Choice is a franchise brokerage. So there's um, a fair number of us dotted around the, the countryside. I've got four franchise areas in, in the greater Brisbane region. Uh, we help consumers uh, uh, buy their buy, buy property, refinance their home loans, uh, review their financial arrangements and, and you know, where possible, try and save them a buck or two. Um, income wise we we make a commission obviously off the um, off the loans that we settle and uh, we're paid an upfront commission and then also a trailing commission as long as the loan remains in force so a uh, big part of our business is, is ensuring customer satisfaction so that we can um, make that that tail as long as possible so I heard something last week actually when I was in Launceston at one of our meetups there that if if the loan gets cancelled or moved then you have to pay back your fees is that right your commissions Correct. Yeah, correct. So if it's generally speaking, if the loan's refinanced out within the first two years of it being set up, um, depending on the lender, they have different callback provisions. You're so right. the generally speaking, the trail stays in place, but the upfront commission that we pay out uh, yeah. will be will be clawed back from your next payment. Yeah, right. That must be pretty brutal because you know refinancing's gotten much more popular in the last few years. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely means or provides a fair incentive to ensure that you're keeping your clients satisfied. Yeah. Like if you, if you drop the ball for two seconds and someone else can step in there, then that your income's at risk. Yeah. It's all about building those relationships and that trust, isn't it? Correct. So how did you start out? Uh, I started out in finance uh, as a bank teller for, for the ANZ. Um, originally from New Zealand, moved across from um, little old Upper Hutt to Noosa in 2006. So and, you went from uh, the ski fields to uh, the beach. The beach, correct. Well, no, yeah, not even the ski fields. It's, it's a rocky old stream. So yeah. But yeah, yeah, we went from yeah small small town New Zealand to to the luxury uh, beach lifestyle, which uh, lasted six months before I realised I was too young for the area, yeah. and uh, moved down to the coast. Well, got transferred to the coast of Bank. Um, yeah, was a was a mortgage lender for them. Uh, for a number of years and then uh, transitioned over to being a mortgage broker. So I was an employee uh, of the business that I now own. Um, started with them in 2008 and then bought the owner out of the previous owner out in 2015. Great. Nice. Well done. And so when you technically became your own boss 2015, so how old were you then when you made that jump? Oh, 29, I think. Um, so I, I was lucky enough, like I, I was a general manager for the outfit um, from 2011 onwards. So I was running the show um, with very little input from the previous owner uh, from about 2011, 2012. Um, so that was, you know, 25, 26. And then on the, yeah, the, day, of, the day of takeover, I was, I was 29. And that was probably one of the biggest shocks is, you know, I had been managing a, a successful team for a period of time, but to wake up, We'll go to sleep one day and then wake up the next day and have now not only just my own family's livelihood at stake, but you know the livelihoods of you know twenty five other staff. It was a it was a big wake up call. Yeah, it's a change. <clears throat> and um, do you have any key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth since you took it over in two thousand fifteen? Yeah, so um, in two thousand and twelve, two, the year prior to takeover, um, we settled two hundred seventy four million dollars in loans. Um, the year after we took it over, we boost that up to 408 mil. So Holy shit. That's massive, huge. Massive yeah. jump. What was the main cause of that? What did you do? Um, we pumped staff in. So we there was a big opportunity in the non-resident lending space. And so we just loaded up on um, uh, from a, a staffing point of view. And not just brokers. We brought in a number of support staff. As I'm a big... Um, 
uh, proponent towards support for brokers, especially in the sales space. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of guys have a lot more, well, guys and girls have a lot more um, capacity than you'd expect. And if you can supply them with the right support, they can max that capacity out a bit better, as opposed to just bring on more sales guys who then, you know, end up cannibalizing yourself because you've yep. got everyone just chasing each other's breakfast, right? Um, and so that's what, yes, yeah, so we've put on a, a, a you know two to one support um, to sales. And and shot that number up from yeah two seventy four to four hundred eight, um, which it was right you know it was it was yeah you know, part of that was helped out by a, a big um, push from non resident borrowers to invest in Australia in the residential space, um, which we then later faced um, some issues with with having a um, you know a big uh, foothold in that space. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And on the support staff, were they all, uh, did you have any of those offshore or they're all? Yeah. And so in, in 2016, we actually um, started up our own offshore um, processing center out of Shanghai because mm -hmm. we had a big number of Chinese clients. Um, that was that, that business supported both our non-resident lending and also our um, onshore lending. Um, it was our first foray into offshoring of clients. Now, it wasn't done necessarily because of saving um, money, although it did. The, the cost of um, staff over there was cheaper, uh, but also to provide us a, a, a base for um, our Chinese-based clients to be able to access us. Yeah. Um, since then, we've actually that that business has been disbanded, and we've gone to and we've engaged with a, a, an offshoring business in uh, the Philippines. Yeah, great. Yeah, I've got three team members at the moment in the Philippines. I've had some for nearly five years now, six years. Yeah, they're great people, really good work ethic. English is excellent. Yeah. And that's what I think, you know, in the broking space, it's definitely become something that people have gone to. Um, where we've been successful is that we've tr we, we treat, these guys are part of the team, like you just said before, you know, they're not just a, 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 an outside resource. If you can engage them as part of your team, you get a significantly better outcome from them. Yep. Um, I've travelled over a number of times, obviously not in the last couple of years or you know, 18 months because yeah. of COVID, but um, that was a big um, uh, help for us to be able to get these guys engaged in our team. You know, we catch up weekly via um, video conferences at least. You know, so team meetings are involved. You know, their feedbacks as valuable as our guys here on this, you know, in Australia. So, the, to be, to treat them as as one as part of the team, you get a significantly better outcome than yeah. what I've heard from other guys that they saw this guy, you know, our resource in Philippines. It's, yeah. Yeah, I've heard that too. So num what about number of FTE when you um, took over from <laughs> effectively yourself as running the business and then owning it? So 2015 FTE, full-time equivalents to what it is now? Yeah, so I mean, we, so we've gone up and down. So um, end of 2000, so the, the day before I took over, there was... I think we're sitting at 21 FTE. Um, by the end of that year, we were up to 36. Mm -hmm. um, we're now back down to just uh, to, what are we at? For, uh, to 16. Um, now, you yeah, know, big part of that middle of two, well, 2018, I think it was. Uh, yeah, 18 through 19 is when the um, um, Royal Commission sort of kicked in, and there was a bit of you know handcuffs put on from a lending point of view to a degree. Um, and prior to that, the year before that. Um, there was a big um, shutdown in the way of non-resident lending as well. So again, we had a, a fairly stacked team to be able to assist with the volume that we were doing prior to those um, changes or you know, hurdles that we face in our industry. Um, so we had to, you know, we had to disband part of the business. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that FT now includes um, the offshore team as well. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I uh, said so it'll be. We, yeah. There's eleven on. Uh, sorry, 12 on um, onshore and four offshore. Yeah, great. And when was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? Um, for me, it was probably through the second half of FY16. So, the, you know, the, uh, about 18 months of, of ownership. Um, the, the business was roaring. We had, you know, huge staff satisfaction. Um, you know, the numbers that we were doing was indic indicative of our client satisfaction, but more importantly, the, the staff satisfaction you know we had a great team everyone was bought into the to the vision and what we wanted to do and achieve and you know it, 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 that was to be able to sit back um and and see you know 36 odd staff enjoying themselves that was that was a big kicker for me yep and what does success look like to you 
success for me um, is freedom in what I want to be able to do whilst seeing or whilst being able to um, provide you know, a comfortable lifestyle for not just my family, but also my staff. Yep. Um, you know, seeing staff being in a, a strong financial position and uh, wanting to come to work and, you know, and coming to me even for, um, you know, a chat, non-work related, you know, just seeing that they, that there's a level of respect there that they um, want to, you know, for my input, not just from a work point of view, but from a personal point of view, that, you know, that impresses me and makes me feel successful. Yeah. And you said team satisfaction. So were you measuring that at all or? Uh, we, we, so uh, in measuring it, not exactly, but if I was to compare it to prior to my ownership, our staff loss yeah. um, previously was quite high. Uh, when I have prior well, sorry, to, wouldn't you wouldn't you just be blaming your your old self though for that no well, no 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 so so I was gonna say so our, so leading into 2010 2011 basically the staff that I started with were, as an employee so yeah. by the time I became management got turned over one got and a half times right. um, from me then step, step stepping in in 2012 the staff stickiness improved yep um through 2000 you know, up until about 2000 and well till i took over i think you know we lost maybe one or two two staff and that was generally in the administrative roles yep through 2016 to 2020 well to where we are now you know i think we've had um we've we've outside of the disbanding of the business where there was a bit of a separation between me and a, a prior owner who was a, a minority yep. um we from a resignation point of view we only lost two staff and that was because they had visa issues not visa issues but their, their visas yep. were expiring so from a staff standpoint, that's where i would ga- gauge that yep. is that look, my team don't leave yeah that's great that is a really good proxy and also i mean you know six, six years effectively have no one leave that is great testament and obviously the years before when you're managing the business so yeah that's that's a great way to measure it mm-hmm. number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast-growing business marketing a fast growing it's hard for me to probably comment on that so much given that you know i do work for a national um or own part of a national brand so there's yeah. a lot of marketing done at that top level however um you know we probably we saw a bit of a dip in the way that our leads um were coming through probably 2018-19, um, which is where it sort of encouraged us to step into the social media space. Now, I don't find finance sexy. It's a hard one to um, promote well, you know, on Instagram and Facebook and that sort of jazz. It's more about trying to get, you know, stay relevant with your current clients and hopefully that they will then flip, the, you know, the sort of the posts and this, um, that you're doing off to their friends and family. Um yeah, you know, and, and we we've gone more. You know, we've engaged a, a third party to do our social media management now, and, and we find that's really working. Um, whereas before, it was sort of a it was a hard one to know where we would be double sport, spending unnecessarily, given yeah. the national brand was doing part of it. Yeah. And how did you fund your business? Like cash flow. So, um, which I wouldn't ever do again, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was like, again, I was lucky enough to come through and take on a um, an, an already trading business. Um, the purchase arrangement that was set up between myself and the prior owner was based around um, me babysitting his loan book. So I mentioned earlier that the way that you know brokers make their money comes from trailing income. So part of the sale agreement was that he retained his his book. So I only took on the um, took on the new clients yeah um but babysat his current clients room so if he if he lost clients there was a penalty provision there and, and so on and so forth so um from a funding point of view i really had to not um well i my main thing was being able to cover the cost of the business from day dot which meant you know 20 odd staff and yeah. and as obviously as we grew that up so we used the x you know as there's some numbers there like before the increase in that settlement volume yep. enabled us to use the cash flow to invest it back into the business to yeah. keep adding FTE. Which yeah. in yeah you know, in our space the biggest our biggest expense yeah, is is our humans. Yes. You know, we're not a production business you know we're not having to hold stock. It's 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 the humans. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? I think I would. Um, it's definitely changed since I have 
um, I started. And I think a big opportunity here, and, and there are guys stepping into the space is more in the tech piece for it. Um, but but I think the belly in the broker role is the humans that are involved, the sales guys, like the, the mortgage brokers and the level or, or volume of knowledge that they that they have. Um, there's so much that a computer that can do. A computer can make things more efficient, but when it comes to making um, decisions and assisting clients to make decisions at the moment, there is a massive element in the um, in the personal side of things. So yes, I would go into it, but it would have a massive push towards the tech side of things. Yeah. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Um, my, my most stressful... Oh, how do you want me to go about this one? Um, it's hard, isn't it? <laughs> She's got to yeah. pick, picking one. A stressful, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, a stressful point for me would have been the Royal Commission, um, yeah. which I don't know if many, or, yeah, hopefully a number of other industries aren't going to get to experience that. Like the mortgage brokers became the whipping boys in the, in the Royal Commission. We were, you know, asked to be the bad guys by a couple of the, um, you know, CEOs, the big banks, yep. uh, which, you know, for me, that pushed me into some of my darkest days. Now that is an, an, an issue that I personally couldn't control and I let it um, affect me far too much. Yep. Um, and that was a, a big learning curve for me after the fact um, was to not focus so much on the what ifs. You had to acknowledge the what ifs, but yep. don't let the what ifs drive um, the way that you do business. Yeah. And so that was yeah the Royal Commission, you know, pushing me into it. And and I've my you know I've got a, a saying you know it's, it's don't fear the unknown, right? And so that it crumbled my saying. Yeah. And I was so um, yeah that was the most stressful. And then I from that I. Um, went off and, and, and um, went after a bit more professional development and and pulled myself out of the yep. out of the dark depths of bearing the unknown and yep. um, we're going good. Great. And what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Communication um, and not necessarily, well, no, yeah, my, my communication as well. Like I think we took for granted what we were doing. And you know, with the number, with the with the growth of numbers right from the get go, we were pretty impressed with what we could do, and it sort of put the blinkers on from potentially where we could improve even further, and and that's come down to communication and and the way that I communicate with my staff and the way that my staff communicate with our clients. Um, that that there is a massive focus for us now, or has been now for the last you know few years, and it's going to forever be a, a main focus because I think communication um, is a significantly important point in, in, in what we in what we do. And what have you enjoyed least about managing fast growth? Keeping that fast growth. I think for for me, you know, a, a real gut check because we had such rapid growth from the get-go, trying to sustain that rapid growth was was a real, you know, real hard one. And, and we haven't been able to stay and sustain that growth. And that and that to me you know, initially felt like failure. Yeah. Um, I didn't like the fact that, you know, when you know, we went up 140 odd percent to then, you know, start tapering off, I was still growing, but it was, to me, it, it felt like I was failing because I couldn't keep there. Lo and behold, I've learned now that, you know, the bottom dollar is the, a good true sense of, of, of performance of a business. And even though our growth isn't there, our, our profitability is uh, representative of what we're doing. So. Yeah, I was going to say that might be a better number to, to focus on rather than top line sales. Having a look at your, your profitability, keeping an eye on that one might be more relevant. Yeah, and then you know we were we were doing significant number of sales, but we had a big number of FTE, and so yep. now we our sales volume has tapered back, which was helped by um, change in policy and 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 then and the industry, and uh, we've wound the FTE back, and our sales volume has tapered back, but our profitability has grown. So yep. um, the you know, there was the, in saying that though there was a um, a purpose behind the way that I went after it from the get-go. Like, given that there is a trail payment, you know, part of our income is a trail payment, what we want is we want to have a really big loan book. And the faster you can grow that loan book, the more residual income you're going to make and you're going to make it more frequently. Yeah. So to grow the loan book rapidly from the get-go was what we set out to do. And now it's a matter of maintaining that book as well as, you know, growing it, but not so much at, a, at such a rapid rate. <laughs> I'm guessing in the last year with the current property boom going on around Australia, you, you guys would have found a new growth kind of bump. 
Yeah, we, we have. It's not as excessive as you might think. I think in Brisbane, you know, there's a lot of chatter around um, the, the properties moving and whatnot, but in the same breath, there's not much stock on, on yeah. available. So, yeah. yes, things are mo uh, moving quickly. Yes, things are going from uh, a lot more than what people have expected them to, but the volume of transactions that we're seeing hasn't spiked accordingly, which, you know, is typical rule of supply and demand, it's that's what's, you know, seeming to be stemming that price growth. Yeah. Um, what's then also adding fuel to the fire from our point of view from a, a number of transactions or the increased number of transactions is the is the um, slowdown from the bank's performance. The banks are taking forever to get deals done. And so there's only so much, you know, fluid you can tip in the in, in through the funnel of the same amount's going to pour out the bottom if the banks aren't improving their, um, yeah. their, their, their processes. What do you love most about growing a small business? Um, in our situation, I've the challenge um, and to see us be able to become financially or very close to being financially free, um, whilst also providing elements of financial freedom to my staff and also being able to help you know my customers um, see you know financial success and, and whatever form or fashion it might be to them. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a, you know, unique to my business in the broken space and that, you know, we take on our clients financial wellbeing is our responsibility and to be able to see not only us be successful, but our clients be successful. That's, that's what's made most exciting. And what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Um, not to, not, not to fear, um, the uncontrollable. Um, in 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 two thousand what was it? Two, October two thousand no, no September of two thousand and nineteen. I took myself over to, to Harvard and Harvard Business School in Boston and and commenced a what they call the Owners Presidents and Management Programs, the OPM. Um, I'm stage one through that and coming out of the first you know extent of that gave me a new lease on life um, in this space and I came back you know far in the belly less clouded mind and not worrying about, you know, not taking to heart some of the smaller decisions that need to be made um, and making those decisions a bit quicker. Like I, I, I pride myself on being able to make quick decisions, but being able to speed the process up on, on um, certain points that really don't have a disastrous or potential to have a disastrous impact on my business, that's um, one of the biggest changes. Right, yeah. <clears throat> and how long was that Harvard course out of interest? I haven't heard that one before. So OPM goes for, it's it goes over, well, we call it two years, but you do three stints on campus. So basically you're over there for three weeks, living on campus, um, living with a co, you know, in, a, in, in, in your cohort. So there's 165, I think, in our cohort, um, living in living groups. So you have eight or seven buddies, eight people in total in the living group. Um, you wake up, you debrief the day at seven o'clock in the morning, start class, finish class around three, four, five, depending on the day. A lot of debrief in the afternoon and you do that from, Monday till Saturday lunchtime and then have Sunday off and then rinse and repeat. So, and that goes for three weeks. Yeah. Um, and then we come back again a year later and then come back again a year later. That's great. And, and um, there's, there's material you go through in between or? Yeah. So it, it, whilst we're there, we're doing, we're using their case study method and we're drilling all sorts of different bits and pieces. I think yeah. we did 40, 40 plus cases last time. When we come back out, there's a lot of tools and whatnot that they send us away with and a bit of research and, you know, personal development and um, I'd, I'd call it tasks, but it's really trying to implement the bits and pieces that you've just taken away from that component of the business, of the, um, of yep. the teachings and applying it to your business. So yeah, there, there is a minimum turnover requirement to um, get uh, accepted into the program. Yep. So that I know, I know I my opinion about it is so that you can freely come out of it and actually make some meaningful yep. shifts. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? So I think for me, it's and something that I do now is just having a process for everything, whether it's from a sales point of view or in your personal space. Um, you know, having a set um, time during the day, it doesn't have to be every day, but at least you know, two or three times a week where you go and work on yourself, whether it be you know, uh, sit down and read or go and do some fitness or play some sport. You need to do something for yourself there. It needs to be regular and consistent and not to let people you know, take that away from you. I think if you're trying to impress all the time and not giving enough time to yourself, it becomes really hard to continually perform. Um, and 
you know, always looking to, you know, always looking to improve that as well. Like we've got a, we've done Kaizen in our business a few years ago and that, you know, Kaizen is the method of continual improvement. It's a, a to- out of Toyota in Japan, isn't it? Correct. If you, yeah. So the Toyota, Toyota production system is all based around Kaizen, lean, right? Le- yeah, lean lean. manufacturing. Yep. Yeah. And so, and, and, and applying that in our business has enabled us to keep the process and, it, you know, that it's, People will say to me all the time, well, you know, but not every client's the same. No, not every client's the same, but we want every client to have the same experience. Yeah, that's a good answer. Mm. And if you can't provide the same experience, then how are you going to consistently, you know, provide a, um, you know, um, generate more business for yourself if, you, if every client's getting the, going to have a different opinion on the way that you perform? So, yes, every client's going to be different, but they need to experience the same process. And so, and, and then you need to continually improve that process. Um, and so a part of our, a part of our um, week uh, in the business is that there's, there's an hour that we've blocked out and it's all around discussing how we can continue to improve yep. our processes and what tweaks need to be made um, to try and, you know, mm. to alter it, so, you know, to, to meet the current requirements of our customers. Have you read The Myth by Michael Gerber? I haven't, sorry. Well, there's a great case study or he talks in there about um, when he goes and gets his hair cut at the barber and uh, the first time is great you know second time something's a little bit different it wasn't the same experience the third time it's all different yet again so yeah it's very much the book's about i think you'd love it very much about uh, what he talks about really is ironically for you is is turning your business into a franchise so you can throw someone the keys anytime yeah. and walk away and they can run it mm, yeah. and that's you know you say before about and i think i said about communication and then what you've just said about the barber for me to try and let or get myself out of necessarily in the being in the broking role, what I was before doing the Kaizen, what we were getting constantly was, oh, you know, I, I had you last time, I had you the time before, and now you've gone with, I've got a different broker and it's just not the same. And for us, a lot of reason behind that was communication. Yeah. But then also the process wasn't always being followed to the T. And well, so it's also having a good system. So you've got the, the information of that client at, the, at your fingertips. You know, when they when they last called and who, who with, et cetera, and say, oh, they're off on holiday, but I'll, I'll be able to help you because you can pick the file up straight away and run with it. Correct. Which we, and, 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 and um, big, big ups to Morgan's Choice. We've got great systems, you know, uh, and, they're, and they're continually getting better. Um, having a good structure and how you utilize those systems is, you know, is, is equally as important. Yep. Do you love talking small business growth with other owners? We have a vibrant online community from many industries around the world. Plus, we regularly add new tools and resources for community members and host two webinars a month to help you grow your small business. GrowSmallBusiness.com Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Yep. Um, so for, for us initially, back prior to ownership, um, we did and we brought on brokers you know, directly into the broken role. Um, needless to say, the guys that came into the broken role directly have since left. Mm-hmm. Um, and a reason for that, I think, is that the, the buy-in to the business is not as great coming into the broken role. And they are, you know, Brokers are hard to retain because they're always looking for another buck if they're you know, straight sales guys. And so, or people, yep. um, we changed the way that we employ um, very quickly so that we could um, ground people within the business a bit better. And so what we would do is we would employ people in the processing roles so um, or the administrative roles where they were um, not doing any sales. They're basically um, taking loan applications after submission through the settlement and um, yeah, processing deals out for us. We then understand which of those um, people wanted to move into the broken space. And so then we give them an opportunity to work as a direct assistant to a broker, yep. particularly myself. Mm-hmm. And so what would happen then is they would be my direct assistant while they learnt sales and policy and, and all the different contacts and, and communications that we need to have in place to be a successful broker. And then as we got to a point where they were confident enough that they could go out on their own, we'd then cut them loose and they'd go and be a broker. Again, under my guidance, but yeah. they would be their own person. Um, and then we'd just rinse and repeat that process. So we would, would engage people and then graduate them up through the business. So they got to cut their teeth at the entry level and then come into the broken space. Now, it doesn't always work. There's been a couple of situations where the guys have thought, yeah, you know, I want to be a broker, but, yeah, they've started off 
uh, with me in the process in the in, in the um, assistant piece, and it and it hasn't really worked, and they've just gone back into their processing role, which yeah. is a is a massive thing that I had to realize was that you know you need to have people that don't necessarily want to progress in your business. Yeah, it's and that's it's a really funny one to talk about. Like, why wouldn't you want to people to succeed and and grow within your business? Well, if they're really damn good at what they do and they want to stay there, yeah. you need to harness them and make sure that they continually perform and still get some feeling of, um, of, of promotion and, and whatnot, but keep them harnessed in that particular role. Yep. And so we've got a couple of, couple of um, you know, a good number of our crew that are, that are in that piece. Um, but then it's a matter of picking and choosing the right guys that want, or, and girls again, right um, people that want to come up through the, the ranks yep. into the broken space. That's a great way to recruit brokers, bring them in, check them out yourself, make sure, you know, yeah. They've got the right attitude, particularly before they're a lot more customer facing. Um, yeah, that's a really smart way to do it. Uh, to be honest, like one of my most successful guys, I was super nervous and I thought his customer facing was going to be the hardest. He's really quiet and and just, yeah, it, 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 I was, wasn't, of, yeah, I was nervous. I didn't think he was going to kill it and he's absolutely killed it. He's been you know, one of our top performers and behind closed doors, when he's performing in front of a customer, he's just a totally different <laughs> a different chat yeah. and so it's um yeah it is it, a tricky one yeah and there's guys who i've thought have been and, and they're still good but they're just you yeah, know they haven't they haven't excelled like i was expecting them to so it's yeah you know a, a human managing people's hardest part of small business well that's one of my strap lines uh, hardest thing in small people are the hardest thing in small business and where the value is at because obviously you can't do it on your own yeah <clears throat> what are some things you'd recommend to building a sustainable kick-ass culture to help with the growth Asking questions, like for me, like if you don't ask, you don't know. And so being able to have an open door where you, your staff will come to you and, and speak to you is, is great. But if you don't go asking for feedback and asking to deliver you to deliver to you how they think things are going, that's, um, yeah, there's a chance you're going to miss things. Yep. But also being able to get them to be open and feel like what they say to you isn't going to come, you know, have any retribution or anything like that. That's yep. a, a significantly important piece like my, my wife works in the business and she she's like the the queen of um of uh the social side of things and you know we, we're, we're always making sure that we're doing things you know just last week we took all the guys out to the first day of the brisbane winter carnival racing carnival so yeah. it's about having you know time outside of the business to enjoy each other's company yep and tell our audience how you've handled balance um r- Balance for me, when I, when I, I learned balance as an employee, well, I got to learn balance whilst I was an employee, luckily enough. Um, when I first started out in the business as an employee, I was working silly hours. I'd leave home at 6 in the morning and get home at half 10 at night. Like it wow. was, it was, but it was because I wanted to. I was single. I had no kids. I had no responsibilities. And for me, it was being able to see as many people as I possibly could, make as many relationships as I could, because I knew that at the beginning, I knew nobody in the space and I needed to know more people knowing more people meant more business and so that's what I did right from get go but it was not sustainable I become unhealthy I got you know overweight I um I split, split personalities but I'd be happy one day and, and not the next and then yep. um, but still loving what I was doing like don't get me wrong I was still passionate as hell about about my role and I and I never have never lost the passion outside of you know during the the um during the the Royal Commission, um, but again, that was a more of a personal issue. But in you know, being able to later on in my journey of in, in the business and being able to give myself um, time to go to the gym and actually fixing it into my calendar and actually seeing my results improve, yeah, that was the ticket. That was like, well, hang on a second. If, if you go and lock down time where you every day, you know, you go leave at the office at five o'clock, you go work out for an hour and a half, then go home, family time. Back to work the next next day and they're having that personal time built in that it was a non-negotiable nobody yeah. could book in you know clients can't book in my staff can't book in i had to give myself that and watching the numbers go up yep it was like hang on a second it's so, counterintuitive isn't it <laughs> you think yeah. you just got to do it with brute force you know, i used to work 80 to 100 hour weeks that was just stupid <laughs> Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's not sustainable. I mean, it, it, yes, and, and I have to be careful here, like, because I, I would love my guys to 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 do that sort of stuff, right? Like, as a business owner, if my staff were going, hey, yeah, we're, look, we're doing this number of hours. That yes, it shows um, passion and and drive for the business, 
but you've got to be so careful that it's not going to cause burnout. And yeah. that, that's going to, again, you said kind of true, you're not going to get the result from it. So, yeah. How much professional development have you invested in yourself? Well, you've yeah, spoken well, about Harvard, but other, other courses or books, podcasts, training, conferences, et cetera? No. So this is the thing. So back when I, you know, when I was an employee, I was provided with a, a coach at one point and it just didn't really work out. And it sort of, not, it, it didn't work out. It, it did, but I just find, I personally found I wasn't getting enough out of it based on the amount of time I was committing to it. And so I made the decision to sort of stop with that and just keep doing what I was doing. It Did I find it impact what I, you know, how I was performing? No. Yep. Um, but now in the business ownership side of things, you know, it, w- it would have been three years before I looked at the Harvard. Well, Harvard has always been in my mind. Like I you know, wanted to go and do a, a block course at Harvard since about 2012, but just timing wise didn't work out until, you know, the last couple of years, which just happened to be was when I really needed it the most yep. as well. So I, I, maybe I've, I've fought it and, you know, and fought against getting professional development. But now having started this and also having the relationships and networks that I've got, seeking assistance um, is is so important, right? And um, I think you're kidding yourself if you think you can perform to your absolute ability without some amount of coaching mm. or, or guidance. Yeah, no, I agree. So, any other mentors or coaches along the way? No, no. I mean, I, I, I bounced off. No, no. No. And no. Do, you, do you have a board of directors or advisors? Uh, not really. So advisors wise, um, accountant and financial planner, um, yep. which I happen to have a, in the financial planning space, I have a JV with them. So right. there's, a, there's a financial incentive to, to yep. use them as well. But, um, but from a, uh, a, a C-suite, no, uh, yeah, it being a franchise model, the, the operations are overseen by myself and my wife. Right, Matt, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Um, the hardest thing in growing a small business is keeping the drive there on those bad days and, and trusting your instinct that what you're doing is right. Like you've waken up with the passion. Um, you, yeah, you had the passion from on day one, making sure that you can sustain that passion and keep it there. Um, I think is, is a hard thing to do, but you've got to trust your own instincts. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Again, this is, I, I haven't gone down the path of it. It's sort of been something I've fought for so long. And, you know, now with being, uh, having done the Harvard bit and having the, the network that I do have there, there's a you know, few key people that I've sort of sided with that, that are sort of my go-to for that bit, those bits and pieces. So, No. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? I can't really call it a tool, but help. Yep. <laughs> you know, understanding who in your industry um, are the right people to go to to you know for help. And again, or not even in your industry, just just finding understanding what things you're not good at yep. and going to try and find help in those areas. Um, focus on what you're really good at and and, and get help for the rest. Final, my favorite question. What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Bring more money to the table. Um, I think for us, like jumping into it, coming, being an employee, stepping into an ownership role, um, knowing how profitable the business was from the get-go, I think that sort of clouded my vision a little bit with um, moving forward. Um, if I had more capital from the get-go, I would have um, done things a little bit different in the way of acquiring staff, um, premises um, and 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 help again. Yeah, you know, I think if I had more capital there, I would have I would have not been afraid to go and spend it on the things like coaching and 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 uh, professional development that sort of jazz. But because I wanted to ensure the business itself kept afloat and not having a massive amount of capital from the get go, those things got pushed to the side i didn't see the value in them so much that i do now and i would 100 percent bring more yep. capital to able to spend on that sort of stuff right well thanks very much for your time today matt i think the audience get a lot of value out of your journey and what you've shared with us and i really appreciate your time thanks troy appreciate it thank you 
And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 